you to everything. And uh, before we start, I'm just I just wanted to 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 say a few things about future focus and uh, the brilliant uh, art hack practice. Um, uh, like series, I'm going to pass for that to Victoria and Susie, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we started Future Focus very recently and in the middle of, uh, of the current crisis to create a space, um, not just for us, but also for our community and collaborators and people around the world to connect and uh, collectively explore and respond to the uh, two ideas in the world uh, at a time of crisis, uh, not, not just the pandemic, but also ongoing crisis that we've been facing the past, uh, like for, for quite a while now and explore how our, as art communities, uh, our work tools and networks and caring uh, for each other can, uh, might help us to reconcile, but also to imagine um, like more considerate worlds. And, uh, and the past few weeks of, of it, and the, yeah, the past like few months, we've been going through a very difficult time and uh, grief and mourning and devastation with, with, uh, with a pandemic, but which has made it quite clear for another time, you know, the huge inequality and injustice gap in our society. But the, um, the, the events of the past week and uh, the, the brutal kind of targeting of like black people, violence and racism has been extremely upsetting. And I just wanted to share, to share that as a start. And, uh, and I know like we usually in our platforms, we share and present good examples and initiatives uh, from the international arts community. But I feel that we also need to talk openly about what is happening and we shouldn't also forget that uh, even the art world needs to do a lot of work in this area and remind us of the, you know, the absence and um, exclusion of black artists and curators from the sector that has happened quite a lot. So I feel that we have a responsibility to kind of um, not just kind of, yeah, to be aware and talk about this, but also to use our, our platforms like this, but any other platform to uh, give a voice to people that are not being heard usually and um, and it's not just you know and yeah and to, to have a di diverse voices um, so without like spending too much more time like to to talk about this uh, I just I'm just wanted to say thank you to Victoria Bradbury and Susie O'Hara the editors of the um, this great uh, art hack practice publication and of course, the amazing uh, speakers that we have today, Ayo, Mark, and uh, Yidi, and Maria, Laura, um, who are joining us for this session. Uh, and just before I, I pass on to Victoria and Susie, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can use, um, please feel free to use the chat to uh, just say who you are, uh, say hello, just uh, share what your thoughts, etc. But also, um, if you have questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A um, uh, function, which is at the bottom of your screen. So we, it's easier for us to, uh, to know what questions are coming in from there. But yeah, but please feel free to use the, the, the chat as well to, to say hello. And I've, we've put in the, in the screen uh, the Twitter handles of everyone who is here today. So if you need to, to, to say something on Twitter or like tag people or like take the conversation further. And also we will be live streaming this uh, on Facebook. Um, I think it's happening right now anyway. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, Victoria and Susie, over to you. Thank you, Irene, and welcome everyone who's here live um, and who's also watching us on the live stream. I want to thank Future Everything for this future-focused platform. I'm Victoria Bradbury, as Irene said, co-editor of Art Hack Practice with the wonderful Susie O'Hara, who's also on the panel. The theme of this session is at home in the network. We're here to talk about our field, new media art, from the perspective of artists and curators. And we have three fantastic panelists and one respondent here to talk about their research and discuss where our field stands today and where it's going. As we begin to feel more familiar with online and network spaces, we consider how existing knowledge of net-based and digital art artistic practices can provide insight during the pandemic and post-pandemic times. Using art hack practice as a starting point, we ask how can digital and online networks, curated experiences, and distribution strategies foster meaningful engagement between practitioners, networks, and remote communities? What novel strategies are being developed to make a shift from physical spaces to completely online experiences? 
what areas will have to pivot dramatically and which are more adaptable. To give you an idea of my own at home in the network, I'm an artist and professor of interactive media at University of North Carolina, Asheville. I'm at home wrangling my six-year-old and one-year-old children and teaching online classes. I taught my virtual reality class remotely this spring um, with the students having no access to virtual reality equipment. My at home in the network comes with a great deal of privilege as I'm surrounded by an America that faces mass unemployment, no plan from leadership, no clear narrative, and demonstrations are erupting in cities and small towns triggered by the murder of George Floyd, by the police in Minneapolis, the murder of jogger Ahmad Arbery by two white men in Georgia, and the viral video of Amy Cooper calling the police on Christian Cooper in Central Park. None of this is new, but it has been brought into focus for white people by the disparities highlighted by the pandemic. As a teacher, I fear for my students and wonder how they're coping or if they're safe. As a white woman and mother, I wonder if I'm doing enough to dismantle white supremacy in my own family and community. Surely I'm not. As an artist, I wonder how the media I create, interactive installation, virtual reality, and creative hack events will even be possible after social distancing. I'm gonna pass it over to Susie now, who's gonna introduce herself a bit. Hi, Victoria. Um, and thank you everybody for, for tuning in today. Um, I'm zooming in from Into the Network from Newcastle upon Tyne in the Northeast of England where sadly we're currently dealing with the highest rate of COVID infection across the whole of the UK. Um, it's primarily created through sustained and chronic underfunding of this region from the government and has led to disproportionately higher levels of deprivation, social and educational inequality and poverty across the region to start on a happy note. Um, as we seem in the UK to be hurtling towards what our opposition Labour leader Keir Starmer has coined an exit without a strategy, uh, the UK government um, seems to be pushing to ease the lockdown restrictions, reopening schools and businesses across the country. We still boast the highest numbers of death rates related to COVID-19 in Europe, with official figures hidden over 50,000 yesterday, second only in the world to America. Um, and it's been argued that we've been suffering from a similar lack of clarity and leadership as our American counterparts. Um, while public trust in the, our government's ability to manage and bring us out of this crisis safely is at an all time low. And it has been, into, you know, incredibly difficult to witness the levels of injustice and racism and police violence that is happening in the world right now, particularly in the midst of so much grief already caused by the COVID virus. Um, and we had actually discussed cancelling tonight's event in solidarity to those suffering from historic and systemic abuse and the impact of societal inequality. But actually, we all felt as a cohort of people that it would be more, as Irene said, positive to use this platform to share the ways in which our creative community of new media artists, curators, thinkers and doers can use um, this network, this platform, to foster agency through engagement and co-creation and support the drive to affect positive change by helping to identify what are those strategies and skills that are needed to be effective in our rapidly evolving and networked realities. Um, so on a personal note, over the past 11 weeks, my family and I have had to become um, increasingly at home in the network um, as I spend, you know, increasing amount of time connected to some kind of device for work. Um, however, like Victoria, I know that I'm really lucky to be in a situation to be able to work from home. Um, Professionally, as a curator, like the majority of people in my sector, I've been managing and pivoting um, artistic and public engagement projects that have been postponed to an uncertain, into an uncertain time in, uh, in the future and pivoted to account for an indefinite number of safety measures which will likely endure post-pandemic. Um, I'm a board member of a small northeast company and working on a knife edge reserves and obviously trying to provide moral and practical support there. And, you know, as a mum, you know, parental and teach teaching duties being interwoven into the workday has, has been fun, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but back to this event, you know, our invitation to these three panellists and, and Maria Lara as a respondent are here is, is, is really deliberate because the issues and circumstances that we're facing in this moment are truly global. And um, while, at the time, while at the same time, 
they're hyper local and really personal, you know. So while I own Victoria are zooming in from the US, Irene, Mark, and I are zooming in from the UK, Yiddy's in Germany, Maria's Lara is, Maria Lara is in India. You know, we thought that it might be useful to begin each presentation, which each of, each of us speaking a little bit briefly um, about what's been happening, where we are in recent weeks and months. So once panelists do that, they'll speak about their projects that they presented in their RTAC practice chapter and perhaps touch on how the current situation has impacted their work. Um, we'll then invite Maria Lara after the three um, authors to briefly discuss her own research. Um, and then she'll have an, an opportunity to respond to the presentations before we open it up into a group discussion. Um, so before I, we begin, I would like to echo Irini's call. So please feel free, use the Q&A tab throughout all of the presentations to drop any questions that you might have uh, for the panelists throughout the presentations. There is no such thing as a stupid question. So fire away um, and I'll crack on with, um, with the introductions. So I'm incredibly delighted to welcome Yidi Yedi Sao to this panel discussion and her chapter, Wikitopia, Hong Kong, Curating a Collaborative Urban Future. Yidi reflects on the Wikitopia, a media arts and cultural, cultural festival that hacks the economic and political infrastructure of Hong Kong to make space for artistic practices and creative collaborative contributions for the future of society. Yiddy's chapter centers on an interview with Ellen Pau, affectionately known as the godmother of new media art um, in Hong Kong and uh, is founder of Wikitopia. She tracks the festival's origins and development over the three iterations, highlighting programming strategies and technical challenges encountered along the way. Yiddy, over to you. You, you're muted, Yidi. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Sorry for the hiccup. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the introduction and the uh, invitation. And I really appreciate your honesty and um, positivity in the introduction. Indeed, this is what we really need and we what we must do at this moment. And especially considering that all the panelists today are going to focus on their projects about community building and social justice in different social political contexts across the globe. And um, hi, those of you who are watching us right now, wherever you are, I'm speaking to you from my home in Berlin, Germany. And at this moment, um, Berlin is kind of normal now. And um, things are resuming, exhibitions are opening, institutions are reopening. Um, and so basically kind of going back, um, not completely. And um, for actually my, I have a per, uh, I have an exhibition that is planned for this June. Actually, it was supposed to open end of June. Um, we completely canceled it, and instead we changed the format into a mail art plus um, an AR website project, which I can talk about maybe a little bit more later. Um, so for now, I'm going to go back to the chapter that I have contributed to art practice, the book. And before that, I think um, I'm gonna actually going to tell a little bit of my personal background as well, because it is very much um, related and fused into my practice. And um, I moved to uh, Germany, to Berlin in 2017 from Hong Kong, where Wikitopia, the project was, uh, uh, took place. And that is actually um, a city where I studied and worked for almost a decade. And before that, um, I was born in Northeast China and I lived there until I was 18. So that means um, this life in Hong Kong, this um, participation in civil movements um, is not natural to me in a way. I learned it um, along the way. So, that is why it is um, 
very much something I reflect a lot, not only in the theory, but also just day-to-day -day interpersonal interactions. And even though everyone knows that the situation in Hong Kong deteriorates right now, and um, however, the resistance is still very strong and I have faith in Hong Kong people because fundamentally they are so kind and caring and responsible for each other. And you probably have also read some uh, stories in the news together with those more gloomy contents in the region. Um, so this event, this festival that I wrote about in the book is pretty much a manifestation of that. Um, it is something that we have been think about, reflected on as cultural practitioners, um, how to contribute to the society, how to contribute to the narrative of community building of the future of the city. Therefore, um, this concept um, of borrowing the wiki technology into an offline collaboration um, is conceived by Ellen Powell, who is an artist, a visionary artist and cultural practitioner based in Hong Kong. And for her, social justice is a, a core concept in her practice. Um, so she conceived the festival Wikitopia in 2009 and that time economically, Hong Kong's adjacent city in China, Shenzhen, you probably have heard of, is considered as a Silicon Valley for hardware and or mecca for makers. And many tech startups have sprung in both cities. However, this movement is more profit driven. The discourse of open source and tech idealism is very scarce. And politically, at the same time, as a previous British colony, Hong Kong has been going through an identity crisis since its handover back to China in 1997. And as China is imposing more and more control over the city, people have a fear towards a dark totalitarian future. And against exactly this um, social and economic backdrop that Alan sees the potential of implementing the wakey way um, in the offline world as a democratic medium and an engine for social change. And I guess um, you're asking what is Wikiway? It's not only Wikipedia, as most of you know the word from probably. And it is actually a technology and an infrastructure that has been implemented in many websites. Um, and it is um, not only, I think, um, we think it's not only a nice experiments of Web 2.0, but also by suggesting collaborative modes of the working process, it challenges conventional concepts of ownership, objectivity, and hierarchical forms of work and social structures. And it brings a certain level of culture shock even to some of its users. As um, the working and organization methods are fundamentally different from our current top-down approach in most institutions and in day-to-day -day life. And this is also very much re relevant to the concept of DIVO, do it with others that Mark will talk about in a bit, um, of which Alan and I are also a huge fan of. Um, and this kind of paradigm change brought forth by technological advancements we find is more instrumental in social re evolutions or revolutions. Otherwise, we'll only slip into a technological dystopia full of state or corporate surveillance as we kind of see the hint of today. And another important aspect of Victoria is that it's a uh, transdisciplinary uh, and apply uh, approach and it applies art in a um, much broader context. So for example, we have a lot of artist workshops that instead of showing the artworks, the artists actually uh, work together with the audience to create the artworks together um, so that everyone has a copy of it. Um, so in that aspect, we also have invited local and international media scholars, sociology professors, information security researchers, hacktivists, technologists, journalists, lawyers, et cetera, from all works of life. And they were brought together to discuss what we can do for a better future. So in terms of community building and crowdsource for a um, speculative future, I think this is also related to our next panelist, Ayo, whose work at Yapo repository 
he's going to talk about is so pertinent to the ongoing discussion right now. Um, and I think this is a good point to pause my presentation and give the floor to Ayub. Thank you. Thank you, Yiri. Um, super interesting uh, discussion about this idea of the wiki as a platform for discussion um, that is less top down and more working across communities and different types of people. I am, we are going to move now to Ayo Ukasinde, uh, who in his chapter in Art Hack Practice, he frames how his collaborative project with Salome Asega, the IAPA repository, developed across a residency at IBM Art and Technology Center and through the Laundromat project. He talks in his chapter about sensitivities that artists encounter as they work between technology and communities while imagining, fabricating, and exhibiting artworks. And he begins his chapter with a personal story of police violence against him in New York City in 2014. Io reflects on the incident, stating in his chapter that I began by contemplating the fear that no matter what I did, who I was, I could never escape my blackness and these violent consequences. This had not been the case in other countries I lived in, Nigeria, Oman, Holland, where it seemed my humanity came before my blackness. I'll hand the conversation over now to Io to talk more about his work. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Thank you everybody uh, for being here. Um, thank you everybody for um, support. Um, I'm going to talk about, so, so I'm going to talk about my work, but I'm also going to talk about some new work that I'm doing. It all relates and it all relates to stuff that's happening now. Um, my work is primarily, oops, here we go. Um, I do a lot of speculative design work, um, sort of projecting my identity into the future, um, building technology that, um, that surveils police, um, building artifacts of the future that sort of envision future African cultures. And the works deal primarily with, um, with social justice issues, um, deal with issues of race, issues of disparity, you know, in the, in the medical field, um, and really tries to address like really systemic racism and systemic violence. Um, in the work that I do, um, so uh, Victoria talked about the fact that I had this experience years ago and now I'm seeing all this stuff on TV and it throws me back um, to those experiences. I've been having nightmares um, and it feels as if um, the black body in America sort of lives in this liminal space between life and death. It's not, um, it's never, even um, George Floyd's um, murder, right? He's not really allowed to die. Um, Trump tries to acquiesce the, the, his soul for white supremacy and for capitalism. So it's this space that the black body lives in that's, that, that I think is really, really close to that line of death. And this perpetual thing that happens over and over again, where um, time sort of, um curls in upon itself um and not in the same way that sort of johannes fabian talks about time and the other but this is like a different space time that uh, blackness 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 exists in and so i've been looking at um octavia butler's um parable of the sower and um the author lifts group infinity minus infinity and thinking about how the use of that space, the use of that turn in of time, how one might be able to utilize that in, in activism. So thinking about that opportunity um, as, a, as a rupture, thinking about the, the idea of the absurdness of the, of the situation, giving rise to creativity, giving rise to different ways of thinking, different ways of, uh, of being. And looking at, um, you know, Primo Levi's work, um, The Drown and the Saved, and thinking about ones that have come before us and what we owe them. Um, and then thinking also about the future, the ones that are to come, and how might we be able to go back to the past to gain knowledge or jump back into the future to gain knowledge. Um, and what it means to defend um, the dead, 
what it means to honor the dead. Um, I, I, um, uh, oops, what happened here? No, that's not what I, okay, here we go. Um, I, I've been teaching, oh yeah, this is it. I've been teaching um, and these are my students that they've been calling me um, from different institutions um, and they're terrified. And they are, they don't, you know, I maybe have some idea about how I might be able to move in the world, right? Some of these students have no idea. Um, they are already disadvantaged and Sorry, I'm just getting a little emotional. It's really hard. There are no words to describe what's happening. Um, in anthropology, we talk about this idea of affect and the way affect comes into existence. It needs language to be able to negotiate its existence. There is no language for what's happening now. And I'm sort of thinking, how does one work with that? You know, so I've been looking at uh, Nuborsi um, Phillips' work, Zong, and the way they use language to sort of get at the unimaginable terror, unimaginable horrors of, of slavery. And I think in this time um, that we are in, we're going through that again, that, um, that inability to, to speak speak what the horrors of um, what's happening is. So I'm trying to sort of look at um, Camus' um, myth of Sisyphus and sort of think about points that he brings up about not accepting status quo, you know, the ability to live in freedom in one's mind at least. And most importantly, the ability to utilize absurdity for passion and to make sure that to to look to look at the absurdity as a source for passion um, and for me that's passion in the arts passion in in social justice causes um, so currently i'm working on a piece called if water killed your child um, that's about the so the suffering dying and survival of um of african americans and it sort of takes Fela Kuti's Water Has No Enemy in the song and uses water as a metaphor, as a place for trauma, but also a place for healing and sort of looks at it metaphysically from the outside inwards. And in the same way, he tries to create a portal that one could embody the pain and the trauma, but also one could use that portal as a means of catharsis, as a way to jump into the past, into the future, to speak with the submerged, to speak with the dead, and maybe gain some sort of solace from that. So, so these pieces are sort of cyber technical, cyber, I guess, techno shamanist pieces that allow you to jump back and forth in time and sort of try to embody some of the pain um, and try to, get some sort of catharsis out of that. Um, some stuff I've been reading, um, could have this available if anybody's interested. And yeah, thank you, that's it. Fantastic, thank you so much Ayo. That's been, that's been really powerful actually for me to listen to. Um, I think some, some of the things that kind of jumped out to me is just this notion of the, that liminal space between the living and the dead. I've never really thought about that. That's not, that's a new concept for me and that's really worth considering and taking forward, but thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome Mark Garrett onto our panel and I'm really pleased to, to welcome you from London. Mark, hello. Um, Ruth Catlow and Mark Garrett have been hacking what an arts organisation could be long before the term art hack was coined. Um, and in their chapter, uh, Daiwo and Daiwo, how do you pronounce that, Mark? I don't know how to pronounce it. Daiwo. 
Darrow, okay. Uh, rehash is oh, It's a silly name, really, but carry on. I will, I will. <laughs> Thanks for making me say it then. <laughs> um, rehashing for partial dominance of art practice. They examine new media art histories of the last 20 or to 30 years that renegotiate power roles, which I think is really pertinent to this conversation between artists and curators, audiences and participants to reform art worlds. Um, they also underline cu current projects that support artists who are employing blockchain technologies to consider how a commerce orientated tool is developing and how artists can represent it before its pervasiveness is all consuming as the internet has now become. Um, I'll leave it to you, Mark. Okay. Uh, I don't think I need my slides for this. I'm just gonna... Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, my heart goes out to the, you know, communities that are suffering fascism in America and around the world, but especially in the US right now. And you have to call it out for what it is. It is pure fascism and it needs to be stopped in whatever way. Uh, so I, you know, so I have certain regarding the COVID virus, we, you, you asked us to discuss a little bit about that. Uh, as some of you may know, I come from a very working class background in the UK. So I'm back in the South End on Sea now with my mum who had uh, a mini heart attack. Her boyfriend uh, collapsed in his own, in his own uh, flat that we had to break into to save him. He was unconscious for two days. Uh, my stepdad had a stroke. This all happened within two weeks. Uh, and two weeks just before the virus started to spread. So my life at the beginning, uh, and I've got an illness as well, and so was trying to sort out uh, our own family and all this panic, COVID panic, uh, which was uh, quite an interesting experience. And obviously National Health Service are gods and angels and, you know, and so, uh, it's, it's been quite it, it's been quite an interesting experience to understand what infrastructural love is, and I think what we're witnessing is the difference between a kind of revenge, infrastructural revenge on people who haven't been accepted in society as official. So that's what's going on in the US at the moment. It's like the systems they've got in place in, in America right now is a system of complete dominance, hatred, be to the system. But not just that, you know, unless you can pay to be looked after, you're not worth anything. And in our society, thankfully, post-war, we had socialism, and uh, which helped us have the National Health Service. And that's why Brexit's come along, because they want to get rid of the connections in Europe that's got its own forms of socialism. Uh, so that's why Furfield exists in a way, because that's part of the spirit of Furfield. So we're a platform of critical practices in arts and technology. And we coined the term die away, do it with us in 2006, uh, as, a, as a way to deconstruct the curator's hierarchy over artistic culture. And in a way, uh, Daiwo is a very similar, uh, kind of, well, Daiwo is similar, but that's with technology and that's with uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. And it's, and, and you put Daiwo next to it, then you've got Daiwo, and it's a kind of just a play, a play on those two words put together. But in, in a way, it's a very serious, critical approach towards working with others, where some of the conversations in the work uh, in the artwork that we all take part in, uh, there's discussions other than just, uh, you know, showing works in exhibitions or whether you become a famous artist or whether you're a genius and all that nonsense. So it's very much about what the kind of uh, collective genius is rather than the kind of how special a colonial genius is. And so in a sense, it's it's 
using certain ideas that had been explored, like situationism in Europe, mail art in, in the US uh, and in Europe and the UK around the 60s, fluxus, cyber feminism, and you put all that together and it's like, uh, it's kind of a critique of how to be art in the 21st century. And in a sense, it's about taking away this kind of market dominated ideology in connection with neoliberalism, which we're all suffering from. And, and this is what's happening, you know, uh, in, in a sense in the uh, kind of like, we're stuck in the 20th century, uh, the psychology of, and, and the art that we produce is a critique of that. And we want to live in the 21st century uh, a good, another good example of how to explore beyond uh, art, traditional art infrastructures is like people like Cassie Thornton we've been working with, who has been doing uh, a really uh, amazing art project called Hologram. And uh, well, part of that project is where, as an artist, she explores alternative ways of being beyond the art object. And, uh, and in a way, it's a kind of like a post Lucy Lippard experience, but very much about like in, in Thunder Bay, very poor area in Canada, she'll set up yoga classes, uh, but the yoga classes are about debt. So you all go to the yoga class and you discuss debt and how that disempowers people's lives infrastructurally. And uh, so in a sense, when we say rehashing proprietorial dominance in art practice, that's what everything we do is all about. And so, uh, you know, so we work with people that actively want to destroy that hierarchical patriarchal narrative that dominates the consciousness of art practice, whatever that looks like, that is our aim. And so, and production, in a way has a proprietary element to it. So, uh, and so when I, but there's another level of that, which is proprietorial. That's the masculine, extra masculine kind of uh, psychology on top of, pri of proprietary, where you kind of like have a body politic control in that relationship psychologically. And uh, so that, that's inbuilt in Silicon Valley software, for instance, that's proprietorial. That's inbuilt in who owns and sells medicine, for instance, that's proprietorial. That's like uh, what type of women are allowed to sing in music in music industry? How sexy are they supposed to look, you know, rather than having really critical lyrics that challenge society? That's proprietorial. So that's inbuilt propriety control over our creative consciousness, like an, an owner. And so that's so that's what we want. So there's a really good uh, image that I remember from uh, Breaking Glass, a punk film, 1980, starring Hazel O'Connor, where you've got the record industry guys all with their hands all over the shoulder holding her. And she's like really doubting her, the meaning of her artwork and her angst and her punk and the spirit of why she exists. And basically uh, there's, a, there's that picture. And, and I wrote a comment in one of the writings I did is that like an owner, he puts a proprietorial arm around her. And then I realized, I looked it up what that really meant. And it said the same thing in the dictionary. And so it just felt so poignant and it linked up to Hart and Negri's ideas around uh, cultural uh, kind of like a body politics. And so in a sense, that's what the technology, the whole point, so Zoom is a proprietorial tool. And so uh, not proprietary tool, proprietorial, because we know that Silicon Valley is a, a brotopia and uh, it needs to be challenged by using, say, Jitsi instead <laughs> in the future. And so uh, don't use Apple, use Linux. You know, if you want to change society, there's many different ways. And uh, so in, in a sense, that's what we, uh, that's what the whole point of it is about, you know. So uh, the, the way to challenge 
societies, not just through violent activism, it's through the tools and the collaborations and the deconstruction of what that relationship is uh, with the medium that you create your voice with. And so you have to kind of break that down uh, and then you, be, then you change as a person and you change collectively. So like, as you know, we work, we work in Finsbury Park, which is like, has over a hundred different languages. And so we run a lot of classes there, permacultural classes, technological classes. Uh, we've had refugee exhibitions. And the whole point is that anyone can do this stuff. And, uh, uh, but the future is, is how we can transfer those skills beyond, beyond just educating the elite. And, and that's, that's where our next phase will be. That's the point. So I'm not going to go, you know, if I go and teach in all this amazing information, I don't want to be teaching people that have been to university. I want to be teaching people that haven't been to university, that haven't had that chance. And so I think that's what the 20th century asks us, because a lot of people won't be able to afford uh, education anymore. And so there's these massive changes. And so you've got groups like anti-university that we work with as well, that are exploring that context. So I don't know what else to say. That was just a kind of relative rant, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> I think we know what you mean, Mark. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, your, your, your comments make me wonder, you know, in what ways digital artistic practices might be pushing against or subverting the market um, and you know what ways can they can they move in this area and then I just wanted to comment on Io's presentation briefly as well um, first of all for sharing um, thank you for sharing what you said about your students because um, I think thinking about young people is, is so important and that idea that you've in speaking with your students you feel you have more um, you know, maybe more agency to move in the world through your own experience um, than, than they have had the chance to experience up to this point. Um, and then also, Ayo, when you showed that you've done those watercolors and that you've been creating new work at this moment, my jaw dropped, I have to say. That's uh, it's not something I've been able to do. So um, I am going to move us on to our respondent, Maria Lara Gadini, who it's so wonderful to see. I have not seen in a very long time. I'm so glad to have her here. Um, she is a researcher of online and network platforms, curator of internet artworks, and founder of Orbits.com, a platform for the production, display, and distribution of commissioned artworks and critical writing. She's a course leader for the Master of Curatorial Practices at Shirsty Institute of Art, Design, and Technology in Bangalore, India. And I'll hand it over to her. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It was uh, very nice to listen to everyone. So um, perhaps I'll give you the context uh, um, related to where I am, as uh, um, Susie and Victoria asked me, so like in relation to the pandemic. So, India had the, so I don't know how much information you have, there was a very, and there still is, there was a very harsh uh, lockdown for over two months. And now we are in a phase which is called uh, Unlock 1.0, despite the fact there's a, a very steep uh, rising curve of cases and uh, of which numbers we don't actually really know. Uh, so, I mean, my experience of what has been happening is, um, it's actually that uh, like all of the inequalities that were already ingrained in the society and the way that actually the government regards its citizens, especially the most uh, vulnerable, have all come out uh, kind of like really violently, violently. So in a way where actually the most vulnerable people have uh, uh, suffered and are suffering an enormous amount of violence. So. Um, so this has been the situation here. It's not uh, rosy, unfortunately. Um, and it, this all comes with this uh, idea of kind of like surveillance control and hiding information, which perhaps is something that I have just like one question for each of you that kind of like builds on it. And it's related to this idea of uh, 
strategies uh, because in my research I've always kind of like been interested in looking at uh, which kind of like uh, strategies artists and curators have developed to kind of instill themselves within a network context being the um, already existing platform a custom built platform or being uh, apps or like new services that uh, we use so I think I'll address like a question for each of you, but then, I mean, I guess it's up to you if there are overlaps um, to kind of like re respond to it. I mean, at the end of this, so for you, uh, um, Yidi, I was actually interested, uh, you know, you, you kind of like mentioned this idea of like uh, a totalitarian context and uh, kind of like surveillance. And I mean, I think as I said right now in, in the experience that we all had, I mean, surveillance and, and, and control have been kind of like endlessly uh, promoted during like this time of pandemic. And uh, they've been coming with two sort of like narratives according to what I've seen. So one of them is we, has been like, this is to protect you, to protect you, your family and the people you love. So it comes with this idea of kind of like care. And on the other side is um, uh, kind of like, this is like our way to control a situation which is chaotic, where there's something that maybe it's invisible and there's something that we cannot foresee. So what I wanted to ask you is if this has had any impact on kind of like your thinking about this idea of like surveillance and control and uh, what what sort of like strategies artists could actually try to develop right now but more than strategy maybe strategies maybe I'm more interested in thinking about what which qualities should an artist have right now to kind of like grapple with this uh, scenario um so and this is the first question. Shall I ask question to everyone and then we move on to them replying? Yeah, that's how. That would be great. That would be great. Okay, so this is the uh, the first one, and then uh, um, so I think uh, um, I mean, are you right? Um, I, I think I mean. Your talk made me actually think a lot, especially with, especially when you were thinking, you know, that there are things that you cannot actually express through language and uh, how do you tackle certain kind of situations uh, in a different way. So I think I'm interested in this idea of like, like the voice and voices, but in relation to this idea of like thinking about uh, our own perspective, what really happens outside, what is not happening, how, how we can deal with it, and, uh, and how we can talk about our emotions. And, and I think what, what I, I wanted to think about is this idea of like, how does this uh, happen on a network environment in a moment where actually everyone is online, has been online, has kind of like shifted their lives online. And uh, there's this kind of like, and everything is used to actually voice opinion in a certain way. And, you know, I mean, what I wanted to ask you is like, what do you think it's happening there? What are the challenges? What are the problems, especially in this relation to this idea of like voicing and the complexity of voicing? Um, so that's my question for you. For uh, Mark, um, I was, uh, hello. So I was, I mean, so I, I feel, I mean, you are an expert in uh, kind of like <laughs> experimenting. Uh, I'm an in, expert uh, in, I'm an expert in being unprofessional. Expert in experimenting with this idea of like decentralizing, like how can that happen, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I'm interested in this, like in relation, I mean, this is actually more related to also what I was like uh, thinking about for Yidi. I was thinking about this idea of like the total centralization of control that I have been seeing in, especially in the past few months from actually government. I mean, maybe, I mean, there's the case of India, but there's also the case of Hungary and there are the, there's the case of other countries. So on the one side, 
I don't know, we are all online, everything's connected. We have this feeling that we can talk about something, but then we are highly controlled and government have been using this moment to actually create situ like a kind of a state of emergency situation where everyone it kind of like enables itself to do whatever they want to or whatever they believe to in. So I, I wanted to know what, how do you think uh, artists could actually kind of like intervene into this? I, I don't even know if it's like in terms of strategies, but also they develop a thinking to kind of like deal with this idea of like centralization and decentralization that it's not just maybe existing within the art world, but it spills out, spills out like you were saying in relation to education. I want, I want to reach everyone, not just like the people who are already in the position of understanding like what's going on or what they've studied or their privilege, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Maria Laura, for those questions for the panelists. Well, we can go in the order that you asked the questions in. So we'll start with Yidi, then Io and Mark and you know, feel free to answer Maria Lara's questions or raise others. Yidi, do you, do you want to take over? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, thanks for your question, Maria Laura. Um, my understanding of the question is that it's about how um, basically about the issue of surveillance in societies and how artists can deal with it. Am I right? Um, so actually, Interesting enough, I was actually thinking a lot about this issue just last week because I was writing up this proposal for IBM and they were asking about how do we deal with like uh, surveillance capitalism, which is um, something I think about, but not as much as I think about uh, totalitarian government. And in my opinion, I think they are so similar in many ways. It's about power structures. And this is also something that Mark has been talking about, like how this like hierarchy in not only the art world, but also in a society, like why, like how do we deal with this kind of power structure, basically? How, why do people who have power over us? And this is something I also very much agree with approach um, that Mark proposed, this decentralized, and open source um, alternatives. And it's not only like, for example, Zoom. Zoom is obviously many people use it, and but there are many alternatives. And I think in terms of artists' response, um, there are a lot of conformist artists, and there are also a lot of artists who think about how to change the system. And I think for this kind of artists, I would actually suggest them to use as many alternatives as possible. So instead of like the power aggregates to certain selected, uh, well-known big name platforms that it's important to think about um, this different ways of dealing with it. And I, this is also some lesson I think I've learned from reading the history of like Soviet Union and how um, people resist the totalitarian rule in these countries. And I think these are totally comparable situations. And in the end, it is a struggle of power. Um, yeah, I think that is my response for this question. Great. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, we'll we'll go um, to Ayo if that's okay now. Um, Ayo, we've got um, your question from Maria Lara, which relates to the relationship between, I suppose, people being online and the complexity of voice and articulation of how we're feeling right now about various about the situation that we're in within our own contexts, but also on, in terms of global issues. But we also have a question from Susanna. Um, which is around um, this notion of absurdity as a source of passion. She asks, do you refer to it as a creative strategy or perhaps a coping mechanism, which I think is an interesting one. So I, I think um, to start with that, the, the answer of, uh, the, from Su um, Susanna, we sort of look at um, Christina Sharp's um, In the Wake and sort of um, she asks, you know, if we if we 
or honest. And if we take into account the black body in America, that the black body in America is all has always been, you know, sort of set upon, we have to take that, you know, into account. If we do that, then what sort of spaces can we sort of how how can we think differently? You know, that's the primary thing that one has to accept. One West one one accepts that, then you know, you can start thinking about how do you sort of branch out. So um so in that in that sense, the the answer Susanna's answer the answer to that to Susanna's question is that it's not a it's not a strategy, it's a tactic, right? It's a way a strategy. It's, it's it's not about sort of surveillance. It's sort of surveillance, right? It's a it's a response. Um, it's a response to just being a being a response of being put upon and a, a response that you need to do for survival. So I see it as a, as a tactic um, and yeah, yeah. I, so I think that that's the answer um, to that question. Now with regards to the other question of language um, and networks, fascism, and white supremacy and capitalism, it's with it's built into this network of America. Um, I don't believe that um, I don't believe that everybody's online. I think that there are some people that are online, but there's some people that don't have the capacity, the, the don't are not given the space to be online. Whether it's they don't have the technology, um, they don't have the knowledge. Um, so the ability to transmit information or to sort of talk about networks, online networks, you know, um, that itself is a particular language. Um, just, just like the fact that we're here using English to discuss things, English may not be able to accommodate, you know, thinking about gender expressions, for example, um, it may not be able to accommodate that, um, or thinking about ideas of hierarchy, it may not be able to accommodate that. Um, so the question is, how do we, how do we, how how can we consider using something other than English or something using something other than, let's say, digital networks, right? Um, and to answer that, I'll refer people to um, Octavia Butler's um, Xenogenesis series, particularly um, the first um, book, Dawn, where she questions the idea of the in, the hierarchy in humanity and questions, you know, is that really necessary? Um, and then looking at her work on slime slime mold and the fact that slime mold is singular and multicellular at the same time um, has multiple expressions of uh, of uh, of sex, and then asks not not that we should sort of try to draw an analogy, um, but to to recognize. And perhaps in recognizing that there is an other, there is, uh, there are alternate ways of thinking, um, the different epistemologies, right? If we are able to accept that, then perhaps we could start thinking about ultim ultim alternate ways of being. So particularly about this, about language, um, doing a project now that, you know, so for example, uh, many times I'm the only, person of color in a room. And um, um, I, we have this expression sort of, you know, thinking, oh, I'm, I'm the only black person here, right? What does that feel like? You know, how, how can you transmit that? Just saying the words doesn't do it. So, and also saying the words in English, right? Takes away from that. So this project is sort of trying to transmit information um, a community comes together, they define these sort of, sorts of visual glyphs. And then that visual glyph is transmitted over um, a network system to a haptic suit where then they feel the, the they, they embody the, the language that um, was created and the language that was created by community. So things like that, sort of like trying to think of speculative ways to sort of bypass language, speculative ways to bypass 
um, systems that are already embedded that have their own history, right? Uh, histories of, of oppression and questioning the, the, the ontological um, um, basis for those um, systems and questioning the epistemological value of those systems. It's challenging because to be able to teach this, in, let's say at a university, a university is an institution that um, um, that yeah, it's difficult to then try to put that and teach that within an institution that has that Im um, already imbued in it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ayo. That's again just really fruitful lines of thought there, um, and I think this notion of plurality of kind of community co-creation, of thinking more broadly about our, our kind of sensory faculties in, in terms of communication, I think is a really useful way to think um, in this space. Um, but I'm super interested in terms of Mark's question from Maria Lara, in terms of a response and um, this notion about how we've seen a kind of control grab from government, um, I suppose, um, in, in, this, in this situation, the kind of opportunistic kind of approaches that certain um, behaviors that we've been exposed to um, throughout this crisis um, and, and how and what the role of artists might be in terms of responding to that, you know, in, respond, in, in terms of communicating that, you know, bringing about new new forms of thinking around that. Mark, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, so uh, some of the people that we've been working with, like we worked with some Australian Aboriginal artists and uh, where we had an exhibition in our gallery and uh, we learned so much from their perceptions about the world and uh, it completely threw us uh, some of the kinds of ideas that they were not ideas, traditions, but they were so out there because we're so used to being within a kind of uh, these systems that just automatically are in place for us as a given, not that they're all useful, but they're there. And their kind of perceptions on how we live, uh, uh, well, they look at us in a very humorous way that we're quite funny to look at because we're so desperate to get from A to B all the time or you know there's so many things that we're battling against within capitalist society that they in their everyday existence we probably emotionally desire to have ourselves and so I think uh, there's a really interesting book that I read called Medieval Hacking and and uh, it and it took us right back to the medieval times, around uh, where people started creating new forms of knowledge that were local and were not based around the hierarchy of Christianity. And uh, but they were scribes, and they started to create their own stories in the Bible, local versions of the Bible. Uh, as messages of their own kinds of uh, local stories of their own local, th that, that locality could be just a village or a town across the UK. And that this was like 500 uh, AD. So, and, uh, and what I find really interesting about that is that what we've learned from technology or what we're learning from it, isn't the technology. It is the ontological side, or it is how we can transform our identities or missions or connections of others beyond the technology and, and, and how we can reintegrate that in older forms of learning that aren't based on 20th century forms of hierarchy. And so I just think that uh, if you go to, if for instance, I was listening to a podcast the other day in my half in my sleep, Native American podcast talking about gender. And I just woke up and suddenly I said, well, wait a minute, you mean they had five genders? 
and and it was like what you know imagine if I was one of those genders how would I see the world then and and I'd with like Io, I I really do believe that we need to be learning uh, 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 not about absolutes but nuances of becoming other than what we are and what we've been des been designed to be and that that's whoever we are you know and and, and, uh, and I just think that's that that's what the 21st century will be about that is what it'll be about people be they will be fighting to be other than what they've been told to be and this is what transgender politics is all about this is what it's people are now claiming to be who they're supposed to be or who they are not supposed to be on their own terms and they're forming new languages to uh, uh, reconnect to something that's spiritual but on their terms. I think that's a really powerful point, Mark. Um, and actually, it's, it's interesting. We've had a question through from Kin, which I think um, kind of can allows for a bit of an augmentation of, of what you're you're suggesting there. And um, Kin says, I wonder what the panel think about the on about online connectivity being an assumed social good, um, or something that is automatically pro progressive. Um, is online connectivity a, nece a, nece a necessary tool in the cultural, social, economic revolutions that need to happen in order to dismantle inequality? I don't know if there's, if there's anybody who wants to pick up that immediately, but we've got just a couple of minutes left. So just a short answer from each of our panelists. No, no. That's a short answer. <laughs> It, it, it's so uh, this whole um, internet technology networks is so new, right? Um, and yeah, I don't. I, I maybe I, I go with Mark. I say I no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. I I have I could I could go on, but I I think just short no. All okay. right, Maria Lara. Uh, no, but. I see some pros. I mean, especially here, um, where I mean, I mean, there are there are pros and there are cons. There are many cons, and there are some pros. Like uh, spaces like uh, WhatsApp have allowed to create on one side, on one side, hegemonic narrative, but sometimes they've also allowed people to share information in languages that otherwise wouldn't be available in any other platform online, as you were saying, everything is in English, it reaches only a certain kind of literate people. So you have something like WhatsApp where you can actually leave vocal messages. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a double sword because it can be used in both ways by, you know, in extreme ways. So I need to think about this more, but it's a no, sometimes yes, Dep it depends on like, like you can't, I don't think you can look at it universally. You have to look at it in a very specific context, in a very specific moment, a very specific time in relation to the idea of, I mean, to the other. Okay, we have two no's and a maybe. What are we, what are we gonna hear from Yiddy? <laughs> No, no and it's not, I don't think it's necessary as such, but it is definitely important, an important tool that we can make use of. And it's, I think it's just as any other um, media technologies that we have, like printing or writing even, like this is, it has defined the um, so certain modes of our communication and we have to adapt our communications to these features of these tools. And um, for example, in the case of Hong Kong protests in the past year, that online connectivity was a really important tool and it was essential and people organized themselves online. And so that was like people, you, you probably have read that as a leaderless um, revolution that is only made possible through the online connectivity. However, at the same time in China, there is certain 
um, level of connectivity, but there is also this huge censorship uh, imposed by the government. And therefore, it actually, I think, it makes um, the situation of equality worse. And people are getting more, the society is getting more and more unequal. So it really depends on how this online uh, connectivity is implemented and how the in infrastructure is built and how people set up the protocol to how to use it together. Thank you, Julian. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, the only way I would accept technology if, if, if the right people owned this technology, that's the, that's it. If, if, the, if we can't own a technology ourselves, if it's not truly democratized, which it isn't, then <clears throat> we're imprisoned by it. I, I think there's, I, I'd like to add one more thing um, that we haven't brought up here, and that's the environmental um, um, uh, externalities of, you know, this. And when I say that, you know, it's, it, the technology is young, you know, even at the age that it is now, the technological impact is devastating. So I think maybe like 50 years from now, if we go along the same path, you know, um, we have to sort of reconsider what, what humanity is redefine the notion of humanity i think without this first and get a grip on how we connect to the environment how we connect to non-human species before starting to sort of embed this within the notion of humanity yeah i just want to add just a small uh short uh comment and just another point that uh the case of Taiwan, the civic tech um, in Taiwan right now during the pandemic. And I think that is a very good example of how te this technology can be democratized and can be used by the people and built by the people for the people and for um, equality. And um, you can just search online for more details, but basically people have built infrastructures to make um, information transparent and available, accessible to everyone. So it kind of, um, people are not panicking during this whole pandemic because they know where things are, where they can get masks, where they can seek for information. And I think that is a very important factor that's how this technology can be used. Fantastic. Yeah, I think the, the danger comes in the siloing of information where people are only receiving certain certain information on their feeds, which is where a lot of the issues are, are coming from around people people hearing only new, the news that they want to hear. Um, I am so thrilled that we were able to bring the four of you together, especially in light of art hack practice. Um, you know, Susie and I developed this project over the last three or four years. It came out uh, last November, and we never imagined, obviously, at that time, the moment that we would be in now. Um, but uh, one positive side is that we're able to get all of you together, because I don't know that we would have thought to do this um, at a different time when we were thinking about arranging events um, in different uh, physical locality localities. So the ability to get your voices together on this platform um, is a real is a real joy and a real opportunity. So thank you all for your time, for your voices, for your talents, um, and for continuing to share them and uplift um, people during these difficult times. And just continuing to do what you do is 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 the most important thing. So thank and you. Just a, a final word for me, really. I think you know one of the things that's come out of these discussions that you know. Um, has really been a powerful kind of eye opener from my side of things is that, you know, books like Art Act Practice, platforms like Future Focus, you know, organizations, artists, you know, thinkers, doers, there's a huge community of people doing really interesting, critically engaged activities that actually, you know, um, are really important and, and it's been really fabulous to be able to bring together, you know, the, the, the kind of very small community that we've kind of pulled together through this book, but also reach out to people like um, Maria Laura and other respondents that we've been able to pull into these calls too. Um, and just a big thank you, massive thanks for, you know, 
zooming in um, having a really good chat. I hope everyone's enjoyed the conversation as much as myself and Victoria have. A uh, massive thank you to the Future Everything um, team, to Irini, to George, to Chris, to all of them that behind the scenes making this thing happen and be as slick as it is. Um, just thank you so much and I hope you'll, you'll um, yeah, you'll kind of touch base with us again in, in session three. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Susie and, uh, and Victoria, and of course, Ayo, Mark, Yidi, and Maria Laura. It's been uh, brilliant to hear your uh, presentations, uh, really inspiring and empowering as well, and your and sharing your ideas. And uh, it's it's something that you know, obviously, we we've been thinking about. Obviously, we started this as an experiment, but we are very much aware of like the. Uh, the problematics of online spaces as well and Zoom and also, but also trying to find uh, always spaces to share ideas, to have critical conversations, which are very much needed more than ever, I think. And we are, uh, yeah, we, we go through like crisis all the time and there's so much that we need to be to be doing so yeah thank you so much there's so much food for thought here and uh, as Susie said we have another um, session for uh, art hack practice which is coming up like I think in, yeah in three weeks time we will share we will post the info so please uh, yeah stay tuned and and we, we want to keep this as transparent and open as possible. So you can reach out to us. Um, there is on our website, the details, if you want to discuss anything, if you have any ideas, uh, anything that you want to bring up or things that we need to be doing, just please reach out and let us know. And thank you again for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so, Paul. Stay safe. Yeah. Thanks. Be safe, Bye. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.